Well, good morning to you and good afternoon. I'm uh, Dan Smith. This is God Talk, and we're glad you're with us. As I tape it, uh, the world has gone completely crazy this last week, and uh, all of a sudden the world just kind of shut down us too. I had three months of mission trips already scheduled for the year. <clears throat> all of those have been canceled. And uh, church services all around us <clears throat> are all going by uh, live streaming. So I preached to an empty church there in La Sierra Spanish Church this last week. And uh, just me and the cameraman. So but I was used to that. That's what we do here at LLBN. So by the time you get this, we know the world may have gone on, but uh, it's a crazy time right now. And, um, and my voice isn't great today, so just bless, pray for a blessing here. I'll try to keep going and uh, hope the message comes through. I retired a few months ago, last July, and <clears throat> in my office, I have a 20 by 20 office, I have 11 file cabinets, and I thought, I've got to begin to weed this down. If we die someday, my sons will hate going through all of this. So it's something to go through 45 years of uh, material and things I thought I might need someday. Well, I don't think I'm going to need some of that now. In the middle of that search, I found an article I had written for Insight Magazine years ago. And uh, these little bits and pieces, I'm sure I have said here and other places. But it was, was kind of interesting to me. Here it was at this day in my life. They wanted me to write an article for young people. These were the ideas that were sort of my, my brand, my theme. Every preacher has certain things that are their pet subjects. So here, here's mine. And I called that Awesome God. For a long time, when I would go on the road, that would be the banner, Awesome God. Anyway, uh, that's what this is. The old story about the Jewish man moved into a Catholic neighborhood. And uh, when Catholics were not supposed to eat red meat on Friday, uh, he would have a barbecue. And uh, the smell would come out over all the Catholic homes, and they would be hungry. So finally, someone got the idea, went to the Jewish man, and he said, how would you like to become a Catholic? So in the joke, he, yes, okay, sure. Goes down to the Catholic bishop and uh, said, this man was a Jew, but now he'd like to be a Catholic. So the bishop took the holy water and uh, waved it over him, and he said, born a Jew, raised a Jew, now a Catholic. Everyone thought it would be all fine. The next Friday, though, he's barbecuing again. What are you going to do? So the Catholics all came running, and they looked around in the backyard, and here he was. He had his little steak there and barbecue, and he had a barbecue sauce, and he waved it over that thing, and he said, born a cow, raised the cow, now a fish. It's changed. We don't convert people like that. We don't just wave magic wands. We convert by thinking it through. We have one idea, and then something comes along that kind of grates against it, and you say, boy, that doesn't fit. And uh, we'd like to push it away. We'd like to keep our little ideas to ourselves, keep it straight. But eventually, that little idea gnaws away at us until we have to adjust to take in the new piece of evidence. Whether that's, you know, the uh, Copernican idea, the revolution, where instead of the uh, universe going around the earth, we're going around the sun. All right, so we have to change. And all the other things that we've had to uh, revise our thinking. And uh, so here's some of the changes that I've had to make and others, and maybe you will ponder today. I was uh, working on a sermon one time back in Chicago. I was doing evangelism every day. My dad was there with me and had been reading a book. And I was in trouble because I was preaching three times at night every week and now had Sabbath morning also. And I had maybe three hours from beginning to end where I could get a sermon done. And I, 
I was just kind of complaining to my dad, and he said, I got an idea, and he read this page. And this pastor, Bill Hybels, who's just retired in Willow Creek, back in Chicago, he had uh, been with a group of fifth graders, and he had said to them uh, a little story about Jesus and the gospel, and he wanted to make an appeal, so he said, how many of you would like to give your life to Jesus? And everybody raised their hand except one boy in the back. He said, why not you? He said, you haven't told me what Jesus is like yet. Why should I give my life to him? And Bill Hybels thought that he had maybe a minute where he could keep that kid's attention. He thought of one Bible verse, John 10, 10. Thieves come in to steal, destroy, and take life. I came to give you life. There is sort of a summary of all the things we need to say about God. Doesn't take life away, it came to give life. Preached that all over the world. So in this article for Inside Magazine, I wanted to begin at the very bottom. So let me just start. We call this apologetics. From Jack Provanja, who used to be teach right here along Melinda. He used to say there's a three main questions in life. The first one is, why is there something and not nothing? And we can't spend a long time. There's a Geoscience Research Institute right down the street. I've got two drawerfuls of arguments and issues, uh, this whole creation evolution issue. But we would say the evidence is pretty clear. We didn't get here by an accident. Something, we came from a God. There is a God. What are the odds of evolution coming up with the, hu with the human eye? You can't have 40 million years of slow evolution. It has to be able to see things from the first day in order for an animal to capture food with the right distance from the sun. There's a thousand things. It just looks like too much design. So we would say, God, there is a God. Number two, is God personal or not? Or is he like a force? Einstein and many people just, they say, okay, okay, there's a God. There's a, something back there somewhere. We have too much uh, complexity for it to be all by accident. But they don't think he's personal. He's not up here listening to prayer requests. He doesn't do miracles. He's not engaged in our world. He created something and the clock begins to tick, but he's not involved anymore. And we would say he's personal, he invented us in his own image. And Jesus said, when I come back, I will take you to be with me, that where I am, there you may be also. He wants a relationship. He's personal. He is the lover in the Song of Solomon, searching and longing, going all over the city looking for his lover. It's God. Relationship. Number three, is that God friendly or not? You could be personal, but not friendly. He could be mean. He could be the ogre. He could be the stereotypical Old Testament God. So we would say he's friendly. Jesus says, I have called you friends, no longer master and servant. And that's the whole story of the Bible, is to make it comfortable. John 1, Message Bible says, Jesus moved into our neighborhood. It's friends. And I don't always understand that. I had a hard set of questions. My grandfather died. I prayed my heart out for him, and he still died. Why didn't he answer my prayer? People die. Uzzah touched the ark, trying to keep it from falling over. And he dies and goes, boy. The two people in Acts 5 who brought some offering in and it wasn't all that they had said they would bring, and so they both died. Wow. Is God friendly or not? But at some point, I finally decided, I think God is friendly. And that's who he is. So here are some bottom line, I'll die for the assumptions about God that I've hammered out over the years, that he is not a thief. Number one, God is exactly like Christ. For a long time, we have separated God and Jesus, and people tried to make Jesus more friendly and more kind. It's almost as if God is sort of growing. They call it process theology, that God is developing, God is learning, God is figuring things out. And finally, we get to the Jesus picture of God. <laughs> and Jesus has to mediate between us and the Father, protect us from the Father. Ah, too bad. Jesus is Christmas and Easter and does miracles for us. But you would never want to hang out with the Father. Jesus, that'd be a, that'd be a great party. Everyone wanted Jesus over to the party, but not the Father. 
Keep us away from the Father. Israelites, we ran away. Don't let him talk to us. But Jesus said over and over again, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. We are ex he was exactly like the Father, Hebrews 1. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his being. I had a young evangelist come into my church years ago, and I don't think he fully believes in the same way. I tracked him down one time. But he had a twin brother, and I loved this evangelist. We were good friends, and uh, we had a good month together. And then, uh, but he told me about a twin brother who was an airline pilot and an atheist and smoking and the rest of it. So one day to play a little game, they traded suits. And the pastor dressed like the airline pilot and the airline pilot dressed like the pastor. Walked into the conference office in our conference in Oregon and <laughs> lit up a cigarette. <laughs> and of course, everyone thought, wow, uh, you can't do that, you're a pastor. He wasn't the pastor. They were identical twins, but they were not identical. But Jesus and the Father are exactly alike. There is no part of the Father was not already in Jesus. And uh, that is really what it means to be a Christian, is that we believe in the Jesus picture of God, not the Hindu picture, the Muslim picture, Confucius, or anyone else. They may all have some wisdom and truth, but we would say, for this, I die for this. Jesus is the best. He is the epitome of God, exactly God, which means Jesus is the last word on God. The Old Testament is not the last word on God. Jesus is the last word on God. Your fellow church members in your community are not the last word about God. One guy came up with a t-shirt. It said, Jesus, save us from your followers. And we all know church members that don't represent Jesus the way we would like. Don't get your picture of God just from your fellow church members or from the church organization. We get our picture of God from Jesus. He's the last word on God. Number two, God cannot be any better than he already is. If we're not careful, we have the idea that we can change God. But I would say if you would like to create the ideal God, and you could just write a list and say, here's my favorite ideas about God. God would still be far better than that. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the mind has conceived what God has prepared for us. What has he prepared for us in heaven? Himself. So God is beyond the best we could come up with. I tried to say to one of my relatives who left God, as we know him, left church and began to explore Every book on Oprah's show, she would buy that. Searching, searching, searching. I finally said, take a sheet of paper out and write down exactly the God that you would be just the happiest with, that you would enjoy him. I said, he's better than that. They used to say about Joe Mean Green, great, great, great football player for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Hall of Fame. And they had commercials, you know, with a Pepsi commercial. It was so good. But then, of course, there were people who had never seen him play, and they tried to ask, how good was Joe, mean Joe Green? And someone said, you designed the best. Joe was beyond that. Just amazing how good he was. That's what God is. C.S. Lewis says, you can take the greatest pleasures you've ever thought of, whether it's music or sports. I, I've been learning how to get my equipment in my house to make music, and then my car, Bluetooth, and had this little speaker, and you could take it anywhere in the house and turn it on Sabbath afternoon. This last Sabbath, we're home. We can't go anywhere because of the virus. We're sitting there cutting felts for mission trips, and we just turned on this great music. Or you think of the best food, or the best party, your best friends, your favorite people in the world. Greatest pleasures, making love, whatever it is. C.S. Lewis said, when you walk into the gates of heaven, you will recognize Jesus, all your favorite people in Jesus. All the best times you've had as a party, hanging out in a restaurant late at night, just because the conversation is so sweet. And you just say, man, I love these people. Never want it to end. I have had moments where we're sitting on a boat in Vietnam in Halong Bay. And after a couple trips to Halong Bay, I don't go on the kayak rides or the bike riding or anything else anymore. I just stay there on the boat. 
and watch as the day goes over with these magnificent islands and this pristine, green, quiet sea. And as the dusk comes and the night comes over, it's, it's just spectacular. And then we go to dinner, and they hand you a dinner that's just for you, designed. And I uh, say, this is, this is pretty good. God's better than that. And, of course, that would mean that God can't love you more than he already does. You can't talk him into it. You can't uh, persuade him to be better than he already is. Sometimes people can pray to sort of give God reasons why he should do something. No, you cannot make God better than he already is. He's the best. He's the best. And, of course, there's no sin that we can do that would make him love us less. It's subtle. Number three, which leads to this point, God is a constant. This is maybe the most profound idea that I have shifted to over my 30 years working on the character of God. Most of us grew up with the idea that you can sort of change God. Pray, get him from here to here. Paganism, you give offerings, you give sacrifices, you give your children, you bring prayers, you do candles, something. And God will see those things. Hindu priest told me, this is a mailbox. You put these things in, and gods are watching. They see what you gave. And if they are happy with what you gave, then they will give you the prayer that you asked, requested. And I will say God is a constant. God is the same everywhere to everybody. I preach this Sabbath. You know, this, is, this virus is not something from God. God did not sit up in heaven and say, okay, you, you're a certain percent of people, you'll get a virus. China, you get a lot. Italy, now we have 1,000 cases, 3,000 cases today. God is not up in heaven picking and choosing. If you're having a hard time in some way, God didn't choose that. This is the broken world that we're in. He can help us learn things from what happens, but he's not one causing it. God is a constant. And I thought that when we sin, <clears throat> God takes us off his A-list, and we have to do certain things to get back in good with God, repent, confess, and so on. I believe in all those things, but not to persuade God. He's a constant. And maybe if we did all those things just right, God would decide to forgive. No, he says, Malachi 3, 6, I change not. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus, <clears throat> the same yesterday, today, and forever. Romans 8, 38 and 39, these great verses. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. The constant. The constant. The prodigal son came home. He was worried that the father would have switched from here to here. And maybe he could be a servant or he would have to do something to persuade the father to accept him back. And the son comes home and the father wraps his arm around him. Nothing has changed. Here's the party. My son is home. God is a constant. We can go over many stories. <clears throat> so we would say God has already forgiven whatever sins we've committed in the past, whatever you're doing right now, whatever sins you may commit in the future. It's a constant doesn't mean we should sin and be crazy. It's already there. Yes, you have to accept that forgiveness. But from his heart, he's already given it. You don't have to wonder whether he will forgive or not. That was already settled at the cross when he said, it is finished. Number four, God longs for a relationship. We already said he made us in his image. He said, I have called you friends. No longer master, servant, just be blind obedience. Friends. Friends. Ponder that. No, we can never be gods. We are never going to be equal in that sense. But that's what's so amazing is that God moves into our neighborhood and says, I want to be with you. Song of Solomon. If your picture of God is only Mount Sinai, then I want to say, hey, add some Song of Solomon to it. Get the whole picture of God. Whenever you have parties with your best friends, he's hoping you'll extrapolate from that to say, 
My God wants to have times like this. The Sabbath is a day to be in a relationship with God like that. And he uses friendships and our family relationships as a sacrament to get a taste of that. Well, we don't just want to say what God is. We want to also say what he is not. Satan's been telling lies about God for thousands of years. He's the father of lies. And we have, God wants us to come to the place where we don't believe any of those lies anymore. He wants to make people afraid of God. Jesus has to come down and say, be not afraid. You don't have to be afraid of God. No more fear. He wants us to blame God for all the disasters and suffering and viruses in the world. No, he said, don't blame God. An enemy has done this. Satan has done it. Satan tries to have us take his own characteristics and bring them into the picture of God so that we worship God, but we worship a caricature of God. And we're really worshiping Satan's characteristics. That's what it means in Revelation to have an image. It's not God himself. It's a caricature. And people can sit and worship and be worshiping something that is far away from who God is. Me too, and I had to give up a lot, and maybe we'll have to clean up some more before it's all done. Why doesn't God just destroy all the evil? Believes in free choice. Can give the good people free choice? You've got to give the bad people free choice too. So we have to be careful with our picture of God. We don't think God burns people in hell every day. I'd ask people, how long do you think you could burn before you would be yelling and screaming curses? The idea that God could burn people for five minutes would be horrible. I think about people who are in an airplane when they die or in 9-11 buildings when they die. Fire, the worst. Kobe Bryant, his daughter. And people try to say, and churches will die for this. They kick pastors out of their churches if they don't hold on to their belief that God burns people in hell every day. The Pope had to put out a statement through the Vatican to say the Pope still believes in hell when the word went all over the world that the Pope had given it up. So not only do we want to believe certain things about God, we have to get rid of all the lies about God. In fact, in Thessalonians 2 is very clear. People will be lost not because they commit certain sins, break certain rules, and God says, I can't stand for that, that they don't love the truth. They believe the lies and say something wrong, terrible about God. How can we have a heaven forever when we don't believe that he's who he is? I've tried to illustrate that in the past. If my wife were to come to me and say, I, I know that you did this thing back there somewhere. I said, I did not. I said, I know, but I forgive you. I said, I don't want your forgiveness. I didn't do that. That has never happened. If she doesn't give that lie up, I don't think we can be together. I don't think I could be with someone and be comfortable when I know they believe such terrible things about me. How can we do heaven with each other if we're believing those kinds of lies and God says all those lies have to be gone? There will be no lies about God among the people that walk into the gates of heaven. I've used this story for years, and I used in this article about Merv Griffin. He used to have a show, television, and a couple times a year he would go to Las Vegas, put on his show from Caesar's Palace. And the story goes that um, he was wandering around, and he saw a little booth, and you put in some music, and there was, I put in some money, and there was music, and there would be a window, and this chicken would dance to the music. And Merv Griffin thought that was amazing, and he went to the found the guy who owned it, and he said, that's really good. Uh, <clears throat> bring your chicken to my show. We'll put you on nationwide TV. Brought it over to the practice for rehearsal that afternoon, and uh, Merv Griffin, I mean, whoever the guy was there, how you doing? And I'm good. He had a chicken, and he said, do you have a plug-in? Yeah, I got a plug-in over here. What do you need a plug-in for? Oh, for my hot plate. He said, what do you need a hot plate for? He said, what do you think makes the chicken dance? <laughs> so the chicken would get hot and would dance to get off the hot, hot plate. And they turned him in for prevention of cruelty to animals organization. Even Las Vegas, <laughs> with all of its callousness to sin, knows that you can't do that. 
to a chicken. And yet most religions in the world, including most Christian denominations, believe that God is a kind of God who if you make him mad, if you don't toe the line, if you color outside the lines a single time, he'll make you burn forever. It's in the official beliefs. Too bad, too bad. Finally, Jesus came to say, when he had one verse, I think the one story would be the prodigal son. If he had one verse, if he knew he'd only listen to him for a minute, he would say, John 10, 10, thieves come to steal and destroy and take life. I came to give you life. I'm not a thief. I don't take life away. I'm not like this. I'm like this. And to give you life. Teaching a class, finishing tonight, for all my students in uh, social entrepreneurship. And I put a little PowerPoint together for them yesterday. And while they're not all religious and they come from all over the world, I just said, I hope you'll take this. And I said, here's a dream God has for you. <clears throat> he says in Psalm 92, excuse me, <clears throat> he says, I want to give you a life where you will flourish like a palm tree by the river. He says in John, I mean in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I came and I don't want you to be afraid. I have plans for you and their plans are for good, not for disaster. You choose what your picture of God is. Why does he have to say that? Because people think that God has plans for you that include some things that might be miserable to you. I thought, I was afraid God would have me marry somebody hateful, miserable, so I would be humble the rest of my life. Where would I get such an idea? I thought God, if I let him have all my life, would take away the good grades I had had or make me not good at sports or whatever else. And I would have to live a life with no pleasure. There'd be no more ice cream. You have to go to prayer meeting every day, sell religious books down the street. That's a picture I had growing up. Scared to death to give God everything. And somewhere along the way, someone pulled me aside and said, no, thieves steal and destroy and take life. I came to give you life. So there's my inside article written years ago for high school kids. Don't know if anyone read it, but here it is. In one summary page, God is the best. He is better than the best we could ever imagine. He longs for a relationship. God is a constant. This is God talk. <clears throat>